Coming up on All About Android, the new iOS 14 features Apple announced this week that mirror some of our favorite Android ones. We'll talk about OnePlus as something new and new Android gaming phones we might be seeing in July. If you're looking for a new smartwatch, we've got information on what Samsung's up to. David Ruddock of Android Police joins us this week. All this and more up next on All About Android. All About Android is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Mint Mobile. They provide the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything is online. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just $15 a month with their three-month introductory plan and get the plan shipped to your door for free at mintmobile.com slash Android. And buy LegalZoom. Don't let legal questions hold you back. LegalZoom is dedicated to helping you with the right solutions. Visit LegalZoom.com today to take care of the important things you need to get done. Welcome to All About Android. This is episode number 478, recorded June 23rd, 2020. We are your weekly source for the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I am Florence Ion. And I am Ron Richards. And this week we are flying without Jason. He, uh, we, we revamped the show. We, we got rid of the arena and then Jason took off on vacation. So yeah, uh, we're going to we're gonna hope... We're going to hope Jason's relaxing right now and having a great time with his family as he well deserves it as the App Arena King. Uh, and we're going to welcome our first guest to the new mm -hmm. All About Android redo, uh, mm -hmm. David Ruddick from Android Police. David, welcome back. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be taking over for Jason as the host of the show. You know, I know it's a big change for everybody, so I don't want to disappoint. So uh, this is the part of the show where we like to touch upon the last time you were on the show. And it was actually September 10th, 2019. So it's nearly been a year, a little less than a year since you were on the show last. Uh, and so much has changed since then. So much. I mean, Jason, Jason's gone. <laughs> the arena is gone. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I will admit that the arena was a source of anxiety for me as a recurring guest on the show because I'm like, wait, what haven't they done already? How many do I need to go through like the second Wikipedia page? Is it on that one too? Oh, it was, uh, yeah. it was definitely a little bit of a challenge. And imagine yeah. the anxiety it gave us for nine years. But uh, I know we, we love you. We love the arena. You know, putting the, putting the doc together, I was like, man, oh, oh I still got to wait. I don't have to pick a nap for today. <laughs> it was, <laughs> you know, it, a, it was freeing a, a little bit. So it's really, it's a you good know, feeling. Gave, gave me a, share, gave me a sense of self. I share in your sense of relief. Yes, so, so exactly. So, well, so David, how is Android police doing in these strange times? Mm -hmm. Android police has been, you know, fully remote from the beginning. So it's really business as usual for me, um, which is great. <laughs> um, you know, I, I go to the grocery store and um, work and that is really my life at this point. So, you know, outstanding. All right. You and let's, let's the grocery get to <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I do. I do carry my laptop around on a little like shoulder strap system I've devised. And <laughs> well, um, you just, I just imagine you going to the grocery store and sitting down <laughs> in an empty grocery store cafe, you know, where they usually have the, the little hot food section. I just, I mean, <laughs> I, I've been dying to get out of the house. That's why I'm imagining you do that. I think I'm, I know. A bit. I, I love to get out of the, I, I walk so much. I walk like six miles every day at this point just to get outside. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it has I'm, gotten kind of hilarious. I, I, wow. I do a I do a walk through the neighborhood in the morning with my kids in the morning and then I'm behind the laptop until I go pick up dinner from takeout, you know, tw you know, 13 hours later. It's just, it's brutal these days. But um, yeah. but anyway, so before we get to the news, David, since the last you've been on, what is your current phone? What is your daily driver yeah. these days? You know, right now I have been using for who it's been since basically came out the one plus eight pro. So I switch off the mm -hmm. galaxy S 20 and I've been with it, you know, for like, I guess it's been like three months at this point, which is a long time for me to stick with a phone. So God, I, I do have so many like things I love about it and so many things that I necessarily like don't love about it. But mm -hmm. overall, if you were to tell me like, like you asked me, like if you're to pick any phone right now that's available, which one would you pick? And I think I'd still pick this one. I agree. All right. I agree. That's, that's a good review right there. 
Uh, yeah. It speaks for itself. It's it's uh, actions over words, right? Uh, you're keeping the phone. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the non-pro right cool. now, and I'm really enjoying the OnePlus 8 experience. Uh, and that's after spending like a week and a half with the Android 11 beta. And I am not used to having such a big phone because I'm coming from the regular size Pixel 3, which is just a little pocket Barbie phone in Yes. You know, when <laughs> held up right next to the OnePlus 8. Uh, I, gave, I let my husband, he's test driving the Pro for me. Um, I kind of have him as my guinea pig because he's coming from two other versions of the OnePlus. So we're uh, we're doing a OnePlus summer in the house. Going to see mm-hmm. how that kind of works out. And maybe it'll uh, determine what phone I keep into the fall. Because I don't know. I don't know about the Pixel. <laughs> <laughs> the Android the 11 beta kinda is took the wind out of the sails, you know, yeah. kinda, mm. <laughs> and also the Android 11 beta is honestly quite buggy, unfortunately, well, so, so buggy. I can't even I couldn't even get through an Instagram story without the whole thing just like crashing. And that's about the only social interaction I have these days. Besides we'll call it a, a retro Android experience. <laughs> exactly. That's a very good way of putting it. Um, oof, it's giving me some really bad, actually, throwback. Uh, why don't we actually jump into the news and we can maybe look forward instead of backwards? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Let's do it. So Burke told us in advance he had nothing witty to say during this. So, Android it's news. It's Android news. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this well, is my most favorite know. my most favorite time of the year now. This is this is excellent flow. Tell us tell us why we're, 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 we we've got stuff to chew on. I was gonna say this might sound a little less like Android news and a little more like Apple news to some of you, but bear with us because we promise it's not that kind of show and we have not changed that much here at all about Android. So yesterday, uh, what was yesterday? Monday, June twenty second was the. Apple, the annual Apple WWDC keynote. And that's the keynote that they usually have right before they launch their developers conference. Now, we didn't have one for Google I.O. this year. Not really. Uh, But Apple's having one. And they had quite a lot to announce. And so uh, yesterday, the company announced new features that might sound a little familiar if you've been on Android for a while. I asked for... I have to say, so I dropped in a link in the show notes because I wanted you all to just get a glimpse of some of the memes that were posted during WWDC. And I have to thank Ron for this because I (laughs) Ron, I said, you know, I kind of wasn't paying attention to what was going on yesterday because I knew I'd catch up later. And the me, you know, a lot of the memes were they're excited about that. We've had that for years. Uh, well, let which me I would like to, it. I would like to, I would also like yes. to note that uh, I was in front of the memes before Flow was. So, like that, that's just true. how upside down this world is now. So it's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, so the memes were mostly, primarily in reference to the fact that iOS 14 is getting widgets. I know you're probably like widgets. Really? That's what y'all were carrying the flag for? Yes, widgets. Um, So iOS 14 is getting widgets that kind of work like live tiles. I had dropped a link to um, a recent Verge article. I thought it was a really good kind of point to make, which was that some of the tiles that we saw uh, in the examples for iOS 14 were very reminiscent of a long ago known Windows phone. And uh, by that, I mean, you would look at the live tile and it would update kind of right there in front of you. And so this is kind of how the iOS 14 widgets work. It's not too different from Android um, because with Android, there's both dynamic and static widgets. It kind of depends on whatever you put on your home screen. But it is uh, interesting to note that that's how it's going to integrate just with the overall iOS 14 interface. It is a slightly different interface than what we have going on with Android. Uh, Their widgets on the Apple side of things, they'll let you see like what's playing in the background, photos from your camera app, clocks to show multiple time zones. Uh, and guys, even the weather, the weather is going to be dynamically changing on those iOS 14 home screens. The future has come. <laughs> Apple has brought it. The weather uh, on is my it, home is screen? It, Are wait, you hang sure? on. Is, is this home screen weather via the app that they bought and shut down that took away from you, Flo? You mean dark sky? I, yeah. I actually don't know. Is it? I see. Don't you don't you think that they bought Dark Sky? They shut it down from Android, and now all of a sudden iOS 14 has weather on the on a home screen widget. 
they just, you know, I, by the way, I still haven't gotten a refund for that app, Dark Sky. So I need my refund for the membership, please. Um, but that's neither here nor there. There's a couple of other, uh, I call them copycat features again, because I want to stoke the flames because who doesn't love a good, um, who doesn't love a good feud, I suppose, especially in these dire, sad times where we're just kind of looking for Thanks to really hold on to. Um, David, you guys had a really thorough listing at Android Police, but I just want to read off a couple of things before I kind of toss it to you because I really, I just really want to hear you dunk on this, if possible. Um, so iOS 14, a couple new features it's getting. Uh, it's getting a translation feature, much like the Google Translate feature, except this one's going to have support for 11 languages compared to Android's or Google's eight. Um, app Clips which are basically Android's instant apps. So this will let you preview small parts of an app without downloading the whole thing to see if you know you want to use it or maybe you just need to use one particular feature of it. Uh, an app library, which is basically Apple's version of the app drawer. So what it's going to do is going to let you hide apps from the home screen uh, and essentially kind of shove them into, again, the sock drawer where things just go and you don't deal with them until later. Uh, picture in picture is another little feature. Welcome to Android Oreo, Apple users. Uh, we've been doing this for a while and it's kind of nice watching YouTube TV and also Googling the terrible reality TV celeb that I am watching on screen. And mm -hmm. also a wind down mode, which is going to help you all on iPhone get ready for bed. We've had this for a while now on digital well-being and the Android world. Uh, again, there's more features for this uh, coming from this sort of like apples to apples comparison. David, is there anything that stood out to you that you were like, seriously, finally, really? Yes. And I think, you know, a lot of them <laughs> stood out a little bit. But the one that stood out in the biggest way was without a doubt the home screen changes. I mean, this has been we're, we're talking about really like we're, we're, we're changing like, you know, church doctrine in terms of like the Apple home screen <laughs> this year. And I think it's really it is an apt analogy because iOS is stuck rigidly by its home screen philosophy since the beginning. You know, I, I've used iPhones, you know, and I understand like there are advantages to I or excuse me, Apple's kind of really strict adherence to it's like, you know, an icon is an icon you can put in a folder. Otherwise, it's got to live there kind of mm -hmm. philosophy. Um, but I think that probably every Apple, let's say, booster, when Apple announced, like, by the way, we're making an app drawer, was like, oh, this makes so much sense. Um, you know, because everybody was like, yeah, I really wish I had a place to put my apps that I basically never use, but I, that I do want on my phone and don't want to be in this kind of totally anonymous folder of things I don't use. And I think that was really the biggest one. The second biggest was obviously widgets. So I am not a big widget user on Android, and I never have been. I would say I use them a little more extensively in the early, early, early days. We're talking like Eclair and Froyo. Yeah. You know, those were those were important features back then. Before Android's kind of notification controls um, were really robust. You know, before a lot of big redesigns around the platform, and before honestly, a lot of apps were good. You know, you, you wanted widgets because you're like, I really don't like interacting with Zap because it it's bad. I'd rather just have it live on my home screen where it serves its purpose and I really don't have to touch it as much. So, you know, those those notifications were make, making up for Android's, you know, poor app interfaces and also poor multitasking on Android, too, in the very early days. But in more recent years, we've seen widgets very obviously stagnate on the platform. You know, I don't think there's anybody that can argue with that, that widgets have suffered in terms of availability and compatibility and overall functionality on Android in the last three, four, maybe even five years. And I think that's partly by design. You know, Google wants the platform to be more naturally interactive, um, to put things where you're likely to find them and not make you like put, you know, a bunch of stuff on your home screen just so you can control certain apps and see certain data. But I think Apple, you know, on the other hand, when they announced widgets in the, um, the left hand home screen, which I believe has a name, but I've forgotten in iOS. When I saw those, I was like, you know, Apple has some good ideas here. And Apple also has far more dedicated developers to the platform who really want this real estate. They want yep, to be yep. seen. And 
you know, they started doing some things where you're like, you know, that's actually a pretty good idea. I would really like that in a widget. Um, really a lot of data viz stuff too. I think it's stuff that may not necessarily be interactive to a large degree, but that kind of passively shows you information and lets you, you know, take in that information without having to go into the app. Um, something that I think most app developers are a bit loath to do because they want you to open the app. They want you to get in there, but on iPhones, you know, views is views, as we would say in the publishing industry, and they mm -hmm. want that attention. So, you know, one of the biggest examples of that was the new kind of, I forget the name of it again, the scrolling app widget on iOS, basically the dynamic one that has many uh -huh. widgets built into a single widget. That was like, to me, like that makes total sense. I am not a huge widget person, but if I knew I could dedicate like a two by, or excuse me, a four by two piece of my home screen to a dynamic widget that I just scroll through, like I would have feed. That's a really good idea and something that Android has frankly never really had in an official capacity. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, people talking about the fact that iOS embracing widgets means that Google probably next year will have a, a sort of come to Jesus moment with widgets again. They're probably right. <laughs> and I, really? and I, think that <laughs> I, I do, I, was, I do that, that, think that's true. That well, I, and it's funny. It, after you flow. I was just going to say that was actually going to be my question to David is if he thought that uh, having this because I know it's frustrating for us being Android users, but sometimes Apple does these things. They announce these things and all of a sudden it lights a fire elsewhere in the industry. And then we start to see it's just like, you know, all the engines start revving up again. And I mean, David, you're right. The widgets have really stagnated. Yeah, and I, I, I do think that we will see once developers look at iOS and say, all right, you know, how can I increase engagement with these widgets? How can I get more people looking at my content? They'll suddenly say on Android, all right, how do I copy this over? <laughs> because they, they'll want the users, you know, there's a clear motivation. So I think this is actually a good thing for Android because widgets are powerful. And I also agree with Tom Warren at The Verge about the live tile thing. Mm -hmm. Apple has definitely taken the best from live tiles and the best from Android widgets and combine them. The idea that the widget should be highly dynamic versus m more leaning towards static and control focus, you know, I think that's that's the right move. I think that people well, what, overall... Oh, go ahead. Well, uh, what I was going to say, well, I was going to say is that it, it seems as if that where Android has learned from widgets and everything that I use for a widget seems to have been incorporated into the notification pane over time. Mm, mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. I, I used to, I used to use the pocket cast widget. Now I use it in the yep. no notification pane, you know, like, sure. you know, weather is up there, like all the, all these things like that. It feels like Android has slowly moved that real estate up into that swipe down thing, which honestly is no different than the swipe left from iOS. When you think about it, ultimately just where you're coming from, but it's how, we create that, you know, kind of engagement. And David, you, I think you hit the nail on the head in that Google is less concerned about having stuff or Android is less concerned about having stuff on the physical real estate and more about leaning into the assistant, leading into, um, that, uh, that idea of context of that. I know that you're home and you'd rather see this. And I know that you're work and you want to see this and the way things work and we've kind of gotten used to it. Um, but it's funny you say about the idea of dynamic, you know, the dynamic widgets. I'm surprised there there isn't a third party developer on Android who hasn't done that already. Like that's actually something like, wow, how come someone hasn't done that on Android? Because on all the platforms that you could, it, that innovation could have happened on Android three years ago. Well, I think there are some widgets, some third party custom widget solutions out there, which admittedly are super enthusiast, super nerdy facing. You know, this is not stuff that ordinary consumers are ever going to use. But there are those tools out there that let you make custom widgets and let them display information that, you know, the app widgets may not. So there is a desire out there. But there's been no impetus from Google centrally to say, like, you know, we've been really thinking about widgets on kind of this like deep you know, functional or excuse me, fundamental level and what their purpose is on the platform. Google has given widgets no attention for years in any, any, any real sense. And I think that is where we will see a change next year. Google will suddenly decide, you know, okay, yes, the notification tray is great, but the notification tray is a very noisy place. And we already see Google embracing this idea. And they have for several years now. The idea of notification bundling and then with Android 11, uh, conversation bundling among multiple apps. You know, Google wants to make the notification shade a less busy, 
a less crowded, less spammed space, which I think is a legitimate concern on Android because Android is much more reliant on notifications than iOS. You know, notifications are truly, I would say, you know, integral to the platform on Android. That is such a huge reason that I personally don't like using iOS very much is that notifications are you know, a lot of people say I'm wrong about this and that's fine, but I think notifications on iOS are bad. I just think that they're mm-hmm. designed yeah. around the kind of a mindset of you, we want you to ignore all noise unless you actively decide you want to look at it. Whereas Android is like, we want you to manage your noise level. We want you mm. to decide what is important, what is not important. And we want to put it in front of you in a way where you can act upon it. Apple has slowly embraced some aspects of this, like notification actions, um, inline replies and things like that. But Google has leaned into this in a big way for years now. They want you to interact with the notifications and they want you to be able to not have to leave the notification shade. And so, like you said, Ron, like this has made, you know, having your actions inside notifications for things like playback control, um, reply functionality, seeing data about upcoming events and things like that, really important to Google. But I think that's come at a true neglect of the home screen and its purpose. You know, Google has been very happy to see the home screen as a place where you have just launch shortcuts and a search widget. And I think the home screen can be more than that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think this is going to be an interesting um, transition for iOS users a bit, or maybe it's not. One thing that keeps kind of coming to mind for me is I keep thinking about how Android in particular, the way it's been, uh, the way it's been sort of molded the last couple of years, it's really been molded around the assistant and having the assistant kind of be the core of all the actions that happen versus what's happening with iOS 14, which is Apple saying, we don't need an assistant to kind of facilitate the same things that Android users are doing. Uh, I think this is just interesting because there's not a huge, you know, even though there, there are mentions of, here's some new features for Apple Maps. I, there, I know a lot of people who aren't using Apple Maps just because Google Maps is just constantly, you know, coming out with fresh new features. Um, but it's interesting that a lot of these new little features are just a part of the operating system and not here's an assistant to kind of like guide you through it. Um, I don't know. I mean, would you agree, David? Like, do you think that our Android world is just becoming much more driven by the idea of this like ethereal, you know, digital buddy versus Apple kind of being like, it's just, it's just the device that does it for you. You know, I think that's interesting because it it is a huge conversation because something we've seen Google really lean into with uh, the assistant in the last couple of years and, you know, kind of interaction on device is accessibility. You know, they, Mm -hmm. they really want to look at assistant as this surface where it doesn't matter what your abilities are. It doesn't matter, you know, what your needs are. You need to be able to interact with this system in a way that feels natural and that doesn't limit you. And I think that's, you know, like, like for example, when I saw Google do the demo um, for speech recognition for somebody who had a real difficulty with speech, um, that was compelling. That was I.O. Mm-hmm. last year, I believe. Right. And I, I, I understood at that point, I'm like, you know, Google is really heavily leaning into this idea that computers should be easy. And I don't, I'm not saying Apple doesn't care about that. But Google cares about it in the sense that they believe AI should be this kind of frictionless surface that lets you get to what you want. And it always kind of I always, you know, go back to Sundar Bachai saying, you know, years and years ago, I think this was when Android, the original Google Assistant launch or Google Now, as it was called at the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, Google Now. (laughs) Google is focused on getting you what you want before you know you want it. And the idea that, you know just interacting with a computer will get you the result you need before you're quite certain about exactly what you want. I mean, that's part of it, but it's also just the idea that Google leans into AI in this big way that Apple does try to emulate. And I'm not saying that Apple's particularly bad at it. I, I think Siri has problems, but I think Siri overall moves in the right direction as far as the industry is concerned. But I think that Google is much more concerned with the idea that, you know, it really should be instant gratification and should, you know, kind of really, it's the idea that I I talk about this all the time to people, you know, kids who are growing up today, 
think about how they interact with computers. A lot of them, their first experience with a computer is, you know, it's going to be A, a touchscreen, and B, it's going to be probably a smart speaker because yep. kids – love smart speakers. <laughs> you know, they love the idea they can talk to this computer and we'll talk back to them. And we look at it and we say, well, that's cute, but that's not a real computer. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really, it doesn't really let you do real things. And I think that's kind of how people looked at phones, right? They said, well, that's cute. You can write a document on your phone, but it's kind of a terrible experience. And, you know, you need a real computer to do that. Well, Trust me, I've written entire drafts of articles on my phone, mm -hmm. you know, now. And that's, can you imagine 15 years ago suggesting that somebody like, yeah, I'm in the publishing business. I write entire drafts of, you know, my work on my phone um, when I'm walking down the street, basically. Um, so I think that Google leans much harder into that version of the future than Apple does. And I think that kind of has driven Android and, quite frankly, Google's own apps in terms of what they're thinking about, you know, conversation suggestions, um, you know, the assistance, you know, general capabilities, things announced today, like, you know, they weren't actually announced, but like Google as of today in Chrome, if you just quickly tap mm -hmm. any word in the Chrome browser on Android, it gives you a definition of the word or if it's term, it gives you a quick card showing you like that term. So it could be a person, it could be a place, it could be an event. Um, it could be a proper noun, like a video game series or a book or a movie. You just tap on it and Google's like, here's what it is. Here's what it means. Here's why, you know, here's why it matters. And that to me is kind of Google's philosophy. You know, the idea that we want to put the information in front of you as quickly as possible, the right information. And we want it to feel seamless. You just touch or say what you want and it's there. And I think that is a genuine difference in philosophies between Google and Apple. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, well said, well said. Now that said, with throughout all that, I will say that it seems like every time one side of the street does an announcement, we get the, oh, they're copying this from mm. across the street. So I do, I it's do want to make sure it is fun. I do, but I do want to make like sure. It's like dueling we restaurants, Ron. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I know. But sweet I do potato fries. Sure we Everybody's got to have them. Exactly, exactly. But like, acknowledge the fact that like the last, you know, the you know the last meaningful time we had a bunch of stuff from Android come out in terms of the OS level. I remember seeing a wave of like, oh, iOS has had that for ages, and oh, da, da, you know, like, and so you get it from oh, both sides. Yeah. So it's not absolutely. You know, so th this is no different than any other major OS update or, or announcement from either side of it. Um, it is it is very interesting though, and it, it for some reason being on the Android side of the street, it does have an extra sting when you see it, and you're like, oh, well, we've had that since you know since lollipop or whatever sure. or whatever uh, version we have so yeah <laughs> i do find that interesting but um hey we wish our our apple friends good luck and enjoy widgets uh enjoy pop out video and all the fun stuff that we've been enjoying for years <laughs> so well welcome to the club so <laughs> all right well um moving on unless there's anything else on ios 14 i mean uh you know david i i, I think you you had such little to say about it i wasn't sure if there was anything else you want to touch on <laughs> no <laughs> not not about the os i had a lot to say about <laughs> apple but ios 14 yeah. you know yeah. overall i i think uh took a took a fair bit from android but in ways that i'm totally down for you know i look yeah. forward to to trying it out I won't touch it. No, I'm just kidding. I'll play with it. I'll check it out. Anyway, um, so real quickly, we got one more bit of news. Um, you know, it seems like this past year has been, the, you know, the year of streaming services, as we've seen, you know, Disney Plus go, you know, go out the door. And then uh, most recently, HBO Max, uh, as well as a whole bunch of other streaming services uh, get rolled out. Uh, but another big player is going to be entering uh, the streaming service arena, and that's uh, Peacock which I cannot say with a straight face, coming from NBC Universal, um, And it's launching July 15th. And what does that mean for all of us in Android world? It's unlike our good friends at Quibi. Uh, Peacock <laughs> is going to launch uh, natively on Android, Android TV, Chromecast, and Chromecast built-in devices. Uh, so Peacock learning where Quibi went wrong. Um, Google users will have access to the same tiers as other Peacock viewers, including the free and ad-supported offerings that arrived in July. Um, Android and Android TV users will get complimentary access to the ad-supported Peacock Premium until October 15th, at which point they'll be charged $4.99 a month. So that's a really interesting way to pull in, you know, like someone's 
got an Android TV, they're dedicated to streaming services. So how better to hook them than give them uh, free access to the ad free experience until October? That that's uh, that's pretty smart. Um, Google users can also upgrade to the ad free version of Peacock Premium for an additional five dollars per month. Um, so there it is. So if you you know if you need to get your NBC Universal fix. Um, they don't have Friends. Friends is over on HBO Max, so I don't know what's going to be on Peacock specifically, but uh, I'm sure there'll be something for you out there. So uh, I don't know. Uh, David, are you excited for Peacock? Would that be um, – God, the Tina Fey, Alec Baldwin show. 30 Rock. 30, yeah. 30 Rock's yeah, probably on yeah. that, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. I don't know if that's worth five bucks a month, but maybe five bucks one month. So <laughs> I will say – um, I'm wondering if this is going to come to YouTube TV. This was not mentioned, but because I just signed up for HBO through YouTube TV and it gives me full max access, which yeah. is kind of, I it's just like, really like the fact that it's all like bundled together. So I just like go into the YouTube TV app. I add the shows to my DVR. And so it'd be kind of cool if we could have this across the different uh, breakout streaming services that are coming through because like CBS has one already, you know, you can watch like the Star Trek series that way. Um, I would love to be able to just have that integrated in one app instead of having to have a folder of streaming apps just so I can choose, That's, you know, what to watch. All right. So That's I'm going to, I'm going to speak, uh, I'm going to speak out of turn. I believe there's an app that does this. <laughs> <laughs> is Hold there because I, I know I know that there is for movies like there's movies anywhere which will collapse all of your digital movie purchases into one app whether you bought them on Google Play or Apple or wherever or Amazon or whatnot so it does exist for movies I don't know if it exists for TV I know that there's a bunch of you know kind of uh, services that tell you where to watch things like just watch if you're like oh I want to watch ER where can I find that it'll yes. tell you what services it's on um, that's what but I was it's thinking not, about, I think. Yeah, but it's not yeah. a it's not a it's it's not kind of like a unifying thing like what's going on with YouTube TV and things like that. I will say as an avid customer of CBS All Access, I cannot recommend it more uh, because the Star Trek shows are great and the Good Fight is one of the best shows on TV. So that's a little free plug for CBS All Access. I am a senior citizen. Um, <laughs> but uh, but so I quickly I quickly looked up to see so if you go to the if you go to Peacock TV the website for Peacock um, they are this is their lead slate that they're advertising to entice people it says hundreds of movies and the example is Reservoir Dogs good movie thirty years old but good movie um, yeah. classic comedy Parks and Recreation huge fandom there I understand Timeless Faves Downtown Downtown Abbey which I know a lot of people like it. Um, Kids and Family with Cur Curious and George, uh, Popular Latino with Betty and in, uh, in New York, and then Current NBC Hits featuring Chicago Fire, which I thought was a parody show. I didn't realize it's an actual show called Chicago Fire. Oh, it's a whole series. So, There's fire and yeah. police, and yeah, yeah, the whole. So whole I guess Chicago. and also. And I feel like they're downplaying the fact that they're going to have all the law and orders. So uh, it's just it's it's this it's this stratification of all of our TV. You know, we went from having, you know, 800 channels on cable for a set price to now it's broken out and we're just going to die a death of a thousand cuts of microtransactions ranging from 499 up to 1599. So well, you're, you're going to pay like the HBO integration because it charged me and it it charged me all together like YouTube TV yeah. and HBO. So it's like I'm paying for cable, but. I have to facilitate it through a set top box or an and you know, a Android device. I don't know. It's just an interesting uh, turn of events with what's going on. And I'm very curious to see how this is all going to, how they're all going to try and make this easier for us because if they're not going to make it easy, I'm not paying. That's all. I okay. So Sorry. I have, I have the app that does what I said it was said yes. it okay. does um it's called real good um one word r-e-e-l-g-o-o-d um okay. and the idea is basically it does act as a directory for all of these services so oh. like it supports everything from netflix and prime video showtime hbo hulu star cbs all access fandor crunchyroll um it also supports like uh stb services um like uh a and e and amc if like if you sign in with a cable provider and so when you click play from real good it actually should just play in the app you select it on and does work on android tv so interesting we're checking out real good that's pretty cool all right there you go see you never know when a good app recommendation is going to happen in the show now that we got rid of the arena they just happen organically so yeah there exactly it is. they're organic yeah. that's what we yeah. wanted <laughs> so. 
All right, we're going to take a quick break and thank our first sponsor. Uh, we want to thank Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode of All About Android. And listen, I you know I got my first cell phone with one of the big wireless providers years ago, like literally so long ago. I don't want to admit the year, um, but I didn't like those high monthly bills. Uh, hate them, in fact. Uh, but then I discovered there's another option that can give me the premium service I'm used to at a fraction of the cost, and that's Mint Mobile. By switching to Mint Mobile, I cut my wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month and saved hundreds of dollars. So for anyone out there who's looking to save without sacrificing service, switching to Mint Mobile is just a no-brainer. So what do you get from Mint Mobile? They offer premium wireless for just $15 a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile can pass significant savings on to you. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text plus crazy fast 4G LTE. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with your existing contacts. So switch now to Mint Mobile and get a premium wireless for 15 bucks a month. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. And listen, I've bounced from Verizon to T-Mobile to AT&T. I've used them all. And the you know having a storefront and all those different things, it adds overhead to the companies. They need to justify it. You end up with high bills. Nobody likes high bills. We use our phones. We, we need our phones. They're our lifeblood at this point. It's what keeps us connected to the world. So why would you want to pay a lot for, uh, for that service? Getting it for $15 a month is seriously a game changer. All right. So get your new wireless plan for just $15 a month with their three month introductory plan and get the plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com slash Android, mintmobile.com slash Android. That's mintmobile.com slash Android. And we thank Mint Mobile for their support of all about Android and giving you a good deal on wireless service. Isn't that great? Thanks, Mint Mobile. All right. Uh, so that said, let's move on to some hardware. Mm hmm. So I do believe that we are all three of us are OnePlus users. Yep. I'm I'm still I'm still rocking the OnePlus Seven Pro, and we heard earlier, you know, from David on the OnePlus Eight Flow and the OnePlus Eight. Um, mm -hmm. So we're you know safe to say we're OnePlus fans. Uh, OnePlus is rumored to have a more affordable phone coming down the pipeline. This is very exciting, um, you know, because OnePlus originally came from this place of affordable phones, and then they kind of you know kind of ratcheted up like everybody else. Um, so this pos this phone is possibly called the OnePlus Z, OnePlus Z or OnePlus Z, depending on where you're from. Um, and it's rumored to launch in India next month. Um, and leaks, mind you, leaks, not confirmations, uh, suggest that it may <laughs> feature a Snapdragon 765 processor, uh, 5G support, 6 gig of RAM, 128 gig of storage. Um, and on Friday, Pei tweeted an old promo for the 2014 OnePlus One, leading some to speculate that the OnePlus Z could have the same 299 starting price as the OnePlus One. A little blast in the past there. Um, and it's possibly not slated for a U.S. release at all. This could be focused on emerging markets, India, that sort of thing, uh, in terms of getting a uh, in for, uh, an affordable phone out there. Uh, so, David, what do, you, what do you think? Is OnePlus go, uh, going back to the uh, affordable range uh, with a 299 phone? So I'll, I'll drop a bit, a little bit of an all about Android exclusive, we'll call it, yeah. um, because Ooh, I haven't really cool. talked about it. So from what I understand, the OnePlus Z or Nord or whatever they want to call it, which if it's called Nord, actually that's quite fitting for a number of reasons. But what I've heard from people who I generally would trust is that mm -hmm. this new affordable phone is being developed by a new division inside OnePlus. So the idea is they're going to operate as basically a sub company inside OnePlus, and that the Nord or Z, whatever it's called, is a phone that seeks to kind of return to OnePlus's roots a little bit and to look at, you know, what can we do with a price constraint more than what can we do just with available technology, period, which is OnePlus's model right now. The idea being, you know, we want to put the best things in our phones and we want to see what the price ends up being. Um, whereas when OnePlus started, you know, it was very obvious they were targeting a price and seeing what they could do within that price envelope, which is different. So yep. I think that, you know, the, the Z or Nord um, makes sense in that respect. That said, um, you know, the Nord name makes sense to me because uh, if you know anything about OnePlus co-founder um, and, you know, kind of the major PR and marketing person for OnePlus, uh, Carl Pei, he is from a Nordic region. 
Um, and so, oh. you know, that might uh, that might be a bit of a connection there. And so what I've heard is that Carl has a pretty big hand in what's happening with this phone and that perhaps that he will, you know, kind of be a guiding force for this new subdivision of the company. So that does make sense to me because the direction OnePlus has gone in recent years, obviously, is much more super premium. Um, you know, in 2020, the OnePlus 8 lineup is obviously the most premium set of phones they've released to date. Mm -hmm. And they've also courted carriers more than ever here in the U.S. So I, I believe that, you know, whatever OnePlus does at this budget range is going to be firmly targeted at India and to an extent Europe, but I think their real market is India. I think this is a phone meant to compete with Redmi, which is a Xiaomi sub-brand, and Realme, which is an Oppo sub-brand. Um, and I think those are the companies they're going after with this phone. And I, I think OnePlus is probably going to give them a run for their money. Interesting. Well, I think that they've given a track record of being able to do that. You know, I think that, you know, like I've been a proponent of the the affordable mid-range phone and, you know, the, it's not like OnePlus hasn't created a presence in the market to give them a, a you know, kind of ad, ad, advantageous uh, approach to pricing, uh, access to chips, act, you know, like they're, they're pumping out a nut. Like when it comes to the supply chain, you know, it's all about volume and it's all about, you know, like if you if you make and sell 100 phones, it's going to cost you much more than if you make and sell a million phones per unit, right? Mm -hmm. And so Absolutely. after all these years, after all these years of building up um, their product line, they've built up that reputation and that that supply chain. And so it seems like now that they're at a point where they've got that kind of I don't know if it's critical mass. It's a bit of a you know kind of a, you know buzzword or kind of you know, concept to go against. But they've got a mass of customer base. Now they can rewrite reroute those uh, resources towards savings towards a more affordable device to further expand their. Reach and further expand their their footprint. Um, so it it makes sense. I mean, I'm glad to see it. I wish it I wish it was an option here in the states, though. Yeah, well, and I I'm, think you know. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Flo. Well, I was just gonna say. I mean, it, it depends on the carrier relationships too here in the U.S. And I would imagine just based on also kind of based what on what I was skimming today with regards to this news, uh, it doesn't sound like that would make much financial sense for OnePlus to come in with that you know, product lineup, it just makes more sense maybe to focus on the flagship here in the U S and, you know, kind of come in under the radar everywhere else in the world. There's, you know, if you go to a Metro PCS or like a smaller MVNO, the phones that you're going to see there are very different than the phones that you would get at a Verizon or AT&T, uh, contract. So makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, sure. I think you're I think you're definitely right. And I think that it the US market is weird. So something that we always have to kind of think about when it comes to selling phones in the United States is that the United States is actually a very strange anomaly in the smartphone mm -hmm. market uh, globally, like we're super weird, um, you know, because of the a availability of credit since phone installment plans became a thing. America has the most available credit to consumers in the world. You know, that's that's, you know, an established fact. And so it makes really expensive smartphones comparatively affordable for people on more restricted incomes, um, which is both a good and a bad thing, because, you know, obviously, if you're buying a thousand dollar phone, it's still a thousand dollar phone, even if you pay for it over 24 months. Um, and, you know, financial literacy is not something the U.S. is known for being very good at, but it affords a greater level of access to these kinds of phones. The other thing is that in the U.S., in the prepaid market especially, what carriers are losing on you know data rates and plan costs, they're trying to gain back on phones. So mm -hmm. they typically at the prepaid level are either selling full MSRP high-end phones um, or full MSRP super low-end stuff with extra high margins. So when you see, for example, a phone like the LG Stylo 6, the Stylo line is very popular in America. It's basically a cut-rate Galaxy Note. Um, but the margins on that phone are probably great for the carrier. Um, as long as you're selling in enough volume. Whereas when you look at something like a OnePlus Z, well, OnePlus's strategy here is probably going to be we are going to cut the margin as thin as we think we can do it based on our brand value and the competition because we want to get market share. Well, if you're a U.S. prepaid carrier, you look at this phone and go, yeah, it's good, 
but it's too good. <laughs> I don't I don't want to stop losing all of the margin I'm making on these kind of crappy phones in order to sell a phone that's better than all the rest of them that doesn't make me any money. You know, mm-hmm. that's not really incentivized for me. And so I think that's kind of why you see the OnePlus C, you know, just not making sense in America while OnePlus is still pushing, you know, carrier partnerships. They obviously want to work with carriers because that's where most Americans buy their phones. So with OnePlus Z, they'd have a much harder sell with carriers. They'd also be in a bit of a no man's land in terms of the price zone in the U.S. Most Americans buy phones that are under $300 or over $700. Phones in that middle zone are kind of a no man's land. And that's pretty well established with the market research. And most analysts kind of agree with that idea. Even if that market is growing, it's not growing very fast. And OnePlus would like to stay focused, you know, on that high end because that's where the money is to be made. And that's kind of where the glory and success are to be found. Well but said. that OnePlus X was such a good phone, though. Just <laughs> as a side note. Memories. Ahead, so. All right. Well, what, there, there's some other good phones coming down the pipeline, pipeline right, that are going to be announced. Yeah. A-Flow. These are not – I don't imagine these are going to be very affordable, but they're definitely <laughs> going to be for an enthusiast crowd. Um July is coming. It's going to be here next week. It's July, and uh, both Asus and Lenovo have phone announcements set for next month. And that's it. That's all we know. Uh, we don't know the exact date. We just know that there are some things to look forward to. We did report on this last week, which was the ROG phone, the ROG, the Republic of Gamers phone from Asus. Uh, we know some of the specs for that are a Snapdragon 865, 16 gigs of RAM, and neato RGB gamer lighting, as I like to call it. Um, so we kind of know that that is coming, but we don't know so much about the Lenovo Legion phone. Now that's going to have more of an emphasis on, uh, battery life and just kind of like be a phone that's powerful. That is, you know, supposed to be for a bit more than the niche. So this one has a 5,000 milliamp battery, supposedly, again, these are all rumored, unconfirmed sort of things. Uh, 90 watt charging, two USB-C ports, a pop-out camera, which uh, I know some people miss from the OnePlus phones, um, and a 144 hertz display. You're not going to get that kind of refresh rate on a phone these days. That's the kind of refresh rate that you find on a gaming laptop. So very interesting. We we don't know, again, when it's going to happen. I think there's some you know, chittering around there that maybe July 15th is the date we might see something like this, but who knows, just something to look forward to, you know, you don't think that they would make this, you don't think they would make this announcement on the same day Peacock was launching. Do that? Do you, (laughs) I mean, let's just think about it, right? Like you don't want to, you don't want to separate your audience that much to make them choose between Chicago fire or the Asus ROG phone three. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't like watching Chicago Fire while playing through their seventh iteration of the World of Warcraft, uh, pl- you know, uh, storyline? Or maybe they're watching Chicago Fire on their Asus ROG Phone Three while playing World of Warcraft with the video and a little pop up right. pop out thing that we've had yeah. since. Because you, know, you can do that on Android. We don't have to wait for iOS fourteen. <laughs> can you even play World of Warcraft on iOS? I'd, Can you play I, World I of Warcraft on Android? Can, I mean, <laughs> I've never tried to play World of Warcraft on an Android phone, but I imagine <laughs> I don't think you can. if I really wanted to make that happen, I could. You probably – oh, I know. I guess there's – yeah, I, I wonder if Steam Link would work for that. I actually don't know. I used to play WoW Classic for a minute, like earlier this year when I was desperate yeah. for entertainment of some kind. But I don't know if you can. But So a, apparently a according, to, according to an app called Remoter, R-E-M-O-T-R – um, here you go, Burke. I'll throw it in the chat. You can take a look at that. Uh, Remoter allows you to play World of Warcraft on Android uh, via via their app. Oh, that wow. sounds so, like a, a horrible experience, but yeah. Remoter great. is you, you can stream and play your own computer games on your mobile phone, tablet, or even smart TV. So there it is, Remoter, R E M O T R. Okay. Yeah, well, there it is. How to play work World of Warcraft on Android. Yeah. We asked these guys, questions don't worry, here. don't worry. Google is going to bring World of Warcraft Classic to Stadia. <laughs> oh, I hope they do, because then I no, I actually don't. Because playing playing WoW on a phone sounds legitimately terrible. But I do find these gaming phones fascinating in a way, because I mean, based on the leak specs for the ROG 2, like these are some seriously weird 
kind of like little value ads or really yep. I, would, I should say like feature ads that Asus is doing like two USB-C ports. You know, I know that was on the previous one too, I believe, but it's there, there are emerging kind of these little extra features on gaming phones where you're like, okay, that actually does make sense for this very bizarre use case. Uh-huh. Um, and so you do see some weird innovation actually happening in this area. I don't want one of these phones. I am not the target audience, but at the same time, I kind of do love to see what they're doing. I agree. I agree. This is like, um, you know, it brings me to the glory days of PC yeah. building, which some would argue they're the glory days are still here. But again, listen, that that this kind of a past for me. But I really do like the idea. I think because part of the reasons I got into the Android ecosystem in the first place, like way back in the day, was because of all this idea of customization. I could, you know, play with the phone. I could do all these like weird things with it. And I would love to see what can really be unearthed from a phone with like this much niche. I'm, I'm very curious. I also just like the idea of uh, this gamer ecosystem that Asus is building around its its products. You can get peripherals that match it. You can get the phone that matches the laptop that you're buying. I mean, I just think that's neat. It's neat from a gadget lover's perspective. The lifestyle brand perspective, absolutely. So when they sent us the, I think it was the ROG phone too, they sent our reviewer it in like a piece of rog branded luggage yes that came with all the about this yes <laughs> it was so good i loved it i i, I just want to meet I, covering phones i just I mean, want to meet no. someone who who is the who is the audience for this though like i've yet to meet anybody with an rog phone or like is true like obviously there's enough of an audience to tap into to make these things right but i've yet to meet so if you are out there and you are someone who uses the rog phone yeah. and and is a gamer on your phone or whatever please email us at triple a aa at twit.tv uh tell us about your experience to give us your personal review because listen a lot, a lot of people uh, listen and watch to the show, right? We, we got a pretty decent audience. There, there's got to be some sort of uh, population out there that's into this. And so I would like to hear from you. Are you excited for the ROG Phone 3 or the Lenovo Legion? Uh, let us know. Please email us. So Yes, please. Cool. All right. Uh, Flo, it's your favorite topic. It's time for some hardware. Uh -huh. Hardware. Hardware. We're bumper for this one. Are we doing the bumper, Burke? I would think so, Burke. Hardware air. <laughs> we got the audio for the bumper. <laughs> Where's this oh, little watch? Hard, we'll just do hardware again. That's fine. Right. Here's a here's a watch. So you know what we're talking about. We're talking about wearables. Um, and actually, it's appropriate that I'm wearing this. So I'm wearing the first gen Galaxy Watch Active, which I absolutely love. I've talked about this before in the show. Um, but hey. There's rumors of another Galaxy Watch, uh, the third generation of just the regular old watch coming through. Um, so apparently Galaxy Watch 3 possibly maybe totally recently hit the FCC. Uh, and rumors are pointing to a, another possible July unveiling. So lots of hardware to look forward to, which, you know, I'm happy about because, again, dire times. I'm looking for any sun on the horizon here. So here are some of the rumored specs of this particular smartwatch. So two size options, a 41 millimeter band with a 1.2 inch display and a 45 millimeter band with a 1.4 inch display. 8 gigs of internal storage so you can store things like podcasts, uh, photos, and Spotify playlists. 1 gig of RAM, which will be nice for shuffling through widgets, which this watch does have because it runs Tizen OS. Um, and on that note, it's possible it's going to be Tizen OS 5.5 running on this one. Support for LTE and GPS. Um, that trademark rotating bezel that's appeared on a couple of different Samsung watches probably will maybe be a part of this particular deal. Uh, stainless steel and titanium variants will be available. Heart rate monitor with eight pulse reading photodiodes, uh, support for blood pressure monitoring, as well as an electrocardiogram sensor. Now the Active 2 had this ECG sensor, but thus far it's only active, 
currently active in uh, the Korean variants of the smartwatch. So um, my, I mean, last I checked, we were still awaiting approval here for that particular tech. I don't know if that's run through. I haven't checked up on that. Um, also, curiously, and this was mentioned in the Android Police article that we linked, uh, smaller battery in this Active 3 than the predecessors. Um, but supposedly it's because it's just optimized. And I mean, if the battery life is anything like what I'm still getting out of the first gen active that I have on my wrist, like I'm fine. I mean, this thing sometimes can go two and a half days without needing a charge and I still get the basic functionality out of it. Now I am particularly just personal note. I'm particularly excited about this because Thus far, the Samsung watches have been the only ones that have really managed to make any sort of stride for us Android users. And David, in particular, I want to know how you kind of feel about what Samsung has been doing for us with regards to wearables, because Wear OS is not exactly taken off. <laughs> Wear OS is terrible. Let's just not pull yes. any punches. Um, I, I, I would say that Samsung is doing more on hardware with wearables than any yeah. Wear OS manufacturer is. I, I think agree. that's inarguable. I think that's kind of like Samsung, you know, for all of their faults and foibles when it comes to wearables, which are many, um, they really want to see the Apple Watch as kind of their aspirational competitor. Mm -hmm. You know, they look at the Apple Watch and say, what does it do? Um, what are we not doing? And how can we do what Apple is doing? And that is making them much more ambitious than Google is with Wear OS. Google seems to be much more focused on what can we do um, and what do we think our partners are going to tolerate. Mm. And that's kind of led Wear OS down a, a not so great path, unfortunately. Whereas when I look at the Galaxy Watch 3 based on what's been leaked so far, I see common sense advancements, um, you know, better health hardware, um, probably reducing the process size of their processor to increase efficiency to increase efficiency and reduce the size of the battery so that they can make the watch lighter and slimmer, um, which I think does matter for a watch, especially if you want to make it for smaller wrists and everything and want to have a smaller diameter for the watch itself. You know, you need to be able to downsize. That does actually matter. Um, Samsung's earliest Galaxy watches were like pretty big. Like uh, what was the this was the Galaxy Watch? Ranger or whatever it was. I forget the name of it. Um, the one that was on Verizon with LT and everything. And it was huge, like oh, dinner plate. It was plate for a very watch. specific user, which is not me. Just saying. Yes, it was for a, you know, a guy who liked to wear a 46 millimeter watch. And uh, just like, oh, I look at that and I'm like, that's terrible. But, you know, there was undoubtedly, you know, they were targeting a specific kind of person there. But I think Samsung, you know, like I said, I have, the, I, I have my critiques of their wearable portfolio. And I think most mm -hmm. of them come down to the fact that the apps suck. Um, third party integration sucks. And TZen itself is best optimized for Samsung phones. Um, non Samsung mm -hmm. phones, you lose some things. Um, so those are all issues. But that said, when I look at TZen and then I look at what's happening, you know, on the other side of the river with Wear OS, I'm like, well, Samsung sure is doing a better job than Google is at this, which is which is sad. So I think that Samsung is setting a bar um, that Google inevitably will have to look to and say, all right, is this something we keep doing? And so in that sense, I think the Galaxy Watch 3 is going to put pressure on Wear OS OEMs like mm -hmm. Fossil. And I think that's much needed pressure and also on Qualcomm. Um, as the chipset partner, um, to say like, can yeah. we make hardware that does things that are, that make these watches meaningfully better? And I think that's that's a hard question, you know, to answer right now. So, you know, I fully support Samsung continuing to go all in on wearables, and I, I hope they keep doing so. Yeah, I agree. And and just to kind of add to this, by the way, uh, Samsung also announced another variant of the Galaxy Watch Active Two. It's uh, the Golf Edition. So anybody, those Damn. of you who are, are watching along with uh, America's phase opening. Wa watching along. 
Yes. Uh, at phase opening, you may have noticed that a lot of golf courses in America are open right now. So it's perfect time to grab a watch active oh, Two golf edition, both for the ladies and the men's. Um, hey, <laughs> so they all like the golf. Everyone and loves you know golf. It, and you know it's for golf because it has holes in it. It has whole yes, it has perforated. It's perforated on the band. Uh, oh, there's a smart caddy app that's preloaded, um, so it gives you real time data and satellite based maps on over forty thousand courses worldwide. Apparently, this is a one hundred dollar value added to the watch. That's cool. Um, listen, I'm still on the first gen active. I love it. I bought this last year originally to go swimming. I'm not going swimming this summer because I don't know if you guys remembered, but there's still a pandemic going on right now. Um, but I will say I'm very pleased, which is why exactly I'm not very interested in Wear OS. And unfortunately, when I toss it over to you, Ron, I might be uh, I might be deflating your balloons a little bit on uh, the next little news item that we have in this well. block. I mean, for the, for those of you, I, mean, I feel like this woman in the photo here on Samsung. Um, well, for those of you who who have been, uh, uh, you know, patiently awaiting an updated uh, Tick Watch C2 Plus, uh, <laughs> it's just been launched with the same design and almost identical specs, um, except for memory, which has been doubled to a whole one gigabyte. Uh, it also comes with a pair of straps in the box, one silicone and one leather. Uh, but sadly... Uh, the C2 Plus is still saddled with Qualcomm's sluggish Wear 2100 processor and Wear OS, uh, the 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 aforementioned much loved Wear OS. Mm-hmm. Um, so the TicWatch mm-hmm. C2 Plus is available today, costing two hundred nine dollars and ninety nine cents, um, and that's one hundred eighty nine uh, ninety nine in British pounds or two hundred nine ninety nine in euros. Um, and you can pick one up in rose gold, Flo's favorite, uh, mm. onyx or platinum. Platinum from the Mobvoi website, the manufacturer of the Tick Watch C2 Plus, uh, or Amazon. So, uh, yeah, I-, I will admit that I had never heard of Mobvoi or the Tick Watch C2 before tonight, but now Wait, I'm really? going to know this the, is like the a C2 very, Plus. This is a very yeah. popular, I mean, I see it, it all over the Android blogs, so that's how all I right, know about it. Popular is a relative person. term. <laughs> Right. I mean, is it though? Think about it. <laughs> I've never seen it in person, but I always like every every time I go into my feed, it's like the tick watch, like, and then somebody's talking about it on Twitter, and then somebody's talking about it in like, you know, Android subreddit, and I'm like, okay, apparently people are buying this watch again. I've left Wear OS, so I, I don't know what's happening over there. Um, and you, you right. know, I have my past as a Samsung fan girl. But my the whole reason thing, I'm here my, right now is because it works. Well, yeah. Well, you, I mean, and then the thing is your Samsung fangirl status is lifetime. So, like, you need to rep something. And so like, you're repping the watch. It's like repping NSYNC versus Backstreet Boys. Correct. Correct. Sure. Sure. Um, and, and the thing is with, with the Wear OS is that I think I feel like we, we've touched on this in the past is that it's pretty clear that, you know, Google – as long as Google keeps making the operating system and OEMs and companies that want to license it and make watches that have smart watch functionality to compete with Apple are out there, Google will stay in that business. I don't feel like despite the the, the acquisition or investment or whatever in Fossil and despite all, all this sort of stuff, I think that honestly, it's like as long as there are mob boys out there and <laughs> other, you know, and, and, and tag you and like all the other weird uh, <laughs> watch manufacturers that want to smartwatch option uh google provides one and they clearly cash that check so i don't blame them um so yeah. tick watch c2 plus double the ram there it is i just want right. to be, before we go to the ad i just want to quickly add quickly add to the conversation the um if anybody needs help setting up a samsung watch so it's like more palatable <laughs> like let me know i've been perfecting this watch for the last year i figured out what apps to download and kind of make it work for me so call me so Flo, i'm gonna clue you in on something i mean that's that's a nice service you're offering everyone but clearly there's value there and there are uh platforms like fiverr or like upwork where you can offer your services and people can pay you <laughs> to configure their samsung watch. or i, think I could that- just write a pitch to my editor David Ruddock, I'm sorry. You could. This is not an appropriate <laughs> this venue. Is, this I'm is happening live, Absolutely. everyone. This Please, is how it write, works. Write about Samsung watches for me. I I, I will love it. <laughs> I, I mean, I, listen, I anyway, watches are a very divisive 
subject are here they? at all that answer. Are they? Are they? Uh, all <laughs> right. They're not. Uh, because, anyway, moving on to the ads. We can make some money we're gonna, here. We're going to thank our sponsor. We're going to pause in this thrilling watch talk, uh, <laughs> and we're going to thank our last sponsor of the evening. Uh, we want to thank LegalZoom for sponsoring this episode of All About Android. And uh, listen, the, the world has changed dramatically since uh, earlier this year. It's a whole new world out there. We're all faced with new challenges. And if you need legal help to overcome some of your challenges, you know that's where LegalZoom fits in. Uh, you know, maybe you've been wondering about the best way to protect your family, or maybe you're thinking about starting a business, but you don't know the best way to do it. Uh, you don't want to let legal questions hold you back. LegalZoom has been dedicated to helping you with the right solutions for more than 19 years. It's not like there's some fly-by-night operation here. They've been here for uh, nearly two decades. So you can trust LegalZoom. Uh, if you're looking to protect your family with a will or living trust, or you're thinking about the right way to start a business with a DBA, LLC, a nonprofit, or more, LegalZoom's got you covered. It's easy to get started online. If you need guidance, their network of attorneys can provide advice to ensure you make the right choices. And since LegalZoom isn't a law firm, you won't have to leave your home and you won't get charged by the hour. And listen, you know, I've talked about it on the show in the past. You know, I've dabbled in entrepreneurship. I've been a small business owner for many years. Um, I've dealt with, I've sold assets. I've bought them back. I've done mergers. I've done things like that. I, I never even took a, cl a legal class at all. And, and the last thing I want to do is pay a lawyer. But the last thing that you want to do is screw that up. Uh, because if you screw up a legal transaction or you screw up something with your business or God forbid you screw up your uh, you know, will or living trust of your family, that can have repercussions down the road. So uh, LegalZoom is there. They help us make informed decisions with their network of lawyers. You save from paying a fortune and you get great advice. Uh, LegalZoom definitely is a service that you want to keep handy for when life gives you those kind of challenges and you need to figure your legal way out. Uh, so visit LegalZoom.com today and take care of some important things you need to get done. That's LegalZoom.com, LegalZoom, where life meets legal. And we thank LegalZoom for all the great advice and for sponsoring this episode of All About Android. Thanks, LegalZoom. And with that, we will do some apps. Burke just took us there into uh, the bumper, which was really nice. We kind of just like bringing the tone down a little bit. Uh, and we're going to talk prepare. about – yeah. Huh? <laughs> she's Flo didn't prepare for this next story, did she? She's just vanished. Yes, I did. I was going to say <laughs> what we're about to talk next is all about <laughs> corporate enterprise software. Woohoo! Um, just kidding. So Microsoft launched a uh, public preview of the Microsoft Defender ATP for Android today. Um, now there is a reason I brought this story and I will explain first. Let me, let me give you the TLDR. So the app is aimed at businesses, uh, offers protection against phishing attacks. It detects malicious apps and malware. Um, so basically it works just like what you would expect from an Android antivirus app. Um, Microsoft also touts the ability to quickly detect sophisticated malware and apps that may display undesirable behavior through its cloud protection capabilities uh, it's also able to block devices that have been compromised from accessing corporate resources. So again, this is an app that is very much like for the enterprise, you know, B2B kind of situation. And it's also uh, currently available to try out for those organizations that have the Defender ATP protection. But the reason I brought this particular news uh, ditty to All About Android is because I just think it's very interesting how much... Microsoft is doing on the Android platform. And I mean, this is really important because if you're running a company, you're doing IT, you want to be able to kind of um, have a little more control over the devices that people are using and, and be able to kind of protect the information um, that you have within the company. And I just think, I don't know, what do you guys think about how much Microsoft is sort of devoted to the Android platform after kind of fizzling away with its own mobile platform years ago who would like to go first <laughs> well i mean it was really no other there was no other option right yeah. like they, they weren't going to embrace apple right That's, like, yeah. like well i'm thinking of microsoft office with regards to apple because remember well, like that whole be. thing was uh, just that whole thing with what a big deal it was that kind of situation that was years yeah ago. yeah I, I, I mean, so I think there are a lot of things to unpack about Microsoft's strategy as regards to mobile. 
um, you know, obviously Windows Phone, um, you know, didn't work out, uh, to put it lightly. Um, but Microsoft has had to kind of adjust where they are as a business and what their customers are doing. Because Microsoft, at the end of the day, is a, a business of business, and they need to understand what businesses are doing. And so, you know, they have these huge enterprise customers, they have these medium-sized businesses, and they also have small businesses. And I think when it comes to this app in particular, you're basically probably targeting the largest of them. The idea being that I run, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a CIO at this big company mm -hmm. and I pay for Microsoft threat protection because, you know, I'm a Windows organization, but I also need to accept the fact that a lot of my employees want to bring an Android device to work um, because, you know, all because A, they know Android and B, because I don't want to have to buy them all iPhones. So, you know, Microsoft basically putting their seal of assurance on an app like this to say, all right, we'll give you, you know, this enhanced protection on Android is basically a cultural thing to me where you have these people in large enterprises and large orgs saying, I trust Microsoft to tell me what applications mm -hmm. are safe. Um, whereas I don't necessarily trust Google. I won't comment on the merits of that because I think that is a much more complicated discussion. But I do think that it speaks to Microsoft's goal, which is to be anywhere and everywhere and to provide the full suite of services across platforms now. You know, they've given up on the idea of a Windows phone. That's not happening anymore. Um, and they're also leaning so heavily into cloud, into being more platform agnostic um, and totally platform agnostic when it comes to mobile that, you know, bringing more of the suite over only makes sense. You know, they want to bring that trust, that brand recognition and that value across as many surfaces as possible. Again, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that's so big, uh, so, such a big part of their strategy now. I, you know, I, I think that antivirus apps for Android are mostly a joke. Mm. But I am not speaking as the person responsible for security of a very large enterprise group. So, you know, the concerns are very different. But I think Microsoft, Microsoft's approach overall has been to say we would much rather in this day and age be an infrastructure and services provider. Mm -hmm. OS is still very important to us, but we recognize that OS is less relevant than it was 20 years ago. We would rather have our business focused on all fronts and say, you know, your experience with Microsoft, no matter what platform you're on, is going to be consistent. And we will provide the same value adds across all those platforms. So I think that's most of what this is about, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's fair. Well I mean, the th and the thing is, is that there there will be that au that audience is out there will continue to be out there. IT departments are not going away or anywhere, and they want options. They're actually right? very so, busy right now. This is some yeah, of the exactly. busiest time for a lot of IT folks, as more folks yeah, exactly. are uh, working from home. And with it's their own and it's devices. funny <laughs> because I know a lot of us, and especially us on this show, lean on Google Apps and su Google Suite and services and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. My my startup is on Google Suite and all this sort of stuff. But when it gets to the corporate level, a lot of big corporations have big problems with Google's uh, uh, yep. flat click here to agree terms of service in terms of who owns the data and things like that. And so Microsoft is really able to carve out a channel for themselves by not profiting off our data, right? And so. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not surprised they'll continue to do it. Um, so good for them. And I, I think they should be. They should. I, I, I want to live in a world where Microsoft is still around because we owe so much to them over the years. So, yeah, I think yeah. They're, they're worth about one point five trillion dollars as of today. So I think Microsoft is in it for the long haul at this point. <laughs> yes, I do, too. All right. Um, so moving on, uh, as we talked about last week, uh, the arena came to we wound down the arena after nine years. Um, rest in peace, arena. Um, right. But uh, as always, at the end of the year, uh, our good friend Tony Morrow on Twitter likes to post the, the stats from uh, from the arena. Uh, and so he took to Twitter as well. And six months sooner than planned, um, shared with us some of the some of the awesome data 
uh, that came out of the arena this this time around. Um, and so first up, and my video seems to be frozen, so I can't see if the graphic is up or not. But uh, if Burke is able to put up the uh, the video for our video viewers, I can refer to it. I see it. You see it? Great. That's all I was looking for. Thank you, Flo. Yes, and. So um, <laughs> so uh, his first graph that he posted was uh, host and guest performance. And Flo, congratulations with, uh, with an, there's my video, with an amazing uh, performance despite maternity leave in less than six Thank months. You. Uh, you dominated with 10 first place uh, wins, uh, you know, beating out Jason with four and me with three and the guest with four and Ant with three. Um, so great job. Um, Flo's final score was 66 points. Uh, me and Jason were one point away with 56 and 55 points. Um, interesting number of arenas present. Jason did 22. Flo, you did 16. I did 20. So that's an interesting. And average scores, Flo, you averaged a 1.5, you know, kind of first, you know, that's a, a lower, wow. lower number of years better. Uh, I was average at 2.4, which is better, slightly better than Jason's 2.64. So uh, very interesting. So moving on to his second tweet, um, host and guest category performance. Um, this is fascinating as always, cause Jason, Jason picks apps from a wide array of categories. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas I seem to be focused on tools. I had eight mm -hmm. apps out of, out of all mine that were tools. Um, and Flo, uh, you also were dominant in, in tools with four, but you, you were pretty spread out with uh, some good representation across the different, um, uh, the different categories that are out there. So interesting stuff. Um, and then lastly, everybody loves a good chart. Um, and here we can see in his last tweet, the chart of performance, and you can see the, the graph of how well we all did. Um, and most notably, uh, flow kind of flattened out while you were out on uh, maternity leave, but then you shot up like a skyrocket and just took off to first place. So good job. Flow here is represented by the gray line in the upper right hand corner. Um, Jason I and I are. Jason and I kind of weave in and out of each other and stay, you know, kind of present with each other while the guests continue to weave as well, too. Um, love data. Data is always so much fun. Um, I, yeah, I just really want to thank the person who put this together, Tony Morrow, who put yep. this all together. Um, I didn't have time to respond to it on Twitter where it was originally posted, but I, you know, the the fans make the show and we just really want to thank everybody for sticking with us. I know that we're changing a couple things on you, but we promise it is, it is for a better future. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I think Ron now is your time to shine on your app spotlight as we kind of yes. take this new approach towards covering apps here on all about Android. Well, yeah. So as opposed to a competitive environment, each week one of us is going to bring an individual app and we'll, we'll kind of share some of the facts about it, do a little demo, uh, have a little discussion about it. And um, I was actually, I had a couple of different options, but then uh, I saw with the new release of Adobe Photoshop Camera, that can't that hit the scene uh, this week. I was like, oh well, we got to do that. And I checked the flow. She agreed. So um, if you haven't seen it yet, the fine folks at Adobe, who you know from Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Premiere, or whatnot, uh, rolled out a camera app that is meant to be a replacement for your camera uh, to use on your phone, which is uh, which is super interesting. Um, what's neat about this is that uh, in addition to being from the fine folks at Adobe, so having some light photo editing tools and things like that that are available, um, they have a bunch of filters. And now I know what you're saying. Oh, Instagram filters, blah, 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 you know, that sort of thing. But what's interesting here in the differentiator is that you can apply these filters through the camera lens as you're framing up your shot. So it's not applying the filter post-processing, rather pre-taking the photo. So you can get a sense of what it's going to look like before you take it, which is really kind of neat. Um, once you take the photo, then you can also apply that filter or as well as other filters. And actually a lot of the filters have multiple modes within them. Um, so you get a different kind of take on it, the, the, um, no matter what. So I, I have the app here. I can show you guys what it is. And again, it is meant to be like, if you, if you want to replace your camera app and you're looking for a replacement of the stock camera app, um, this is an option from Adobe. And it also depends on what your interest level is in photography, because what I'll, I'll, I'll first, I'll say what this app doesn't have. Um, it doesn't have a lot of the manual control. 
controls. So if you're looking for a camera app that allows you to adjust the exposure or the f-stop or all that other kind of you know aperture and all that fun stuff, uh, there this app doesn't have it. Right? This is uh, a step down from the pro camera app kind of level. Um, and so let's just like to set the table for it, set our expectations. Um, you're not getting a ton of like photography you know, advanced photographer kind of tools at hand with the app. But if you're looking for a different way to take photos and to get some cool kind of art, artistic kind of things out there for your Instagram or for whatever uh, photo sharing that you want to do, this could be a good option. So um, I've got it up here on my app, uh, on my phone. Uh, and so if you tap on it, it immediately just goes there. You can see my, there's my laptop, right? That's the, the thing right there. Um, and so this is what the what this is what the the app looks like upon opening, right? So you've got the shutter button down in the lower in the lower middle center of the big white button to take a picture. Um, up top, you've got the three dots in the middle there, and I'll just go on a white space here so you can see it. Um, and that expands the menu. Um, and you have very limited options. You can change the aspect ratio. Right now it's set to nine nine by sixteen, or you can set it to three by four. You don't get one by one, um, so it's just those two options there. Um, you can turn flash on, on auto or turn it off. Um, and then you get the, the gear icon for the settings and the settings take you to the app settings. And there's actually not much there, uh, in terms of how the app actually works in the preferences. It's just where you're saving to things and sending crash reports. So there actually aren't a lot of settings there to work with. Um, of course you can, in the upper right hand corner, you can choose the front facing camera, um, but then down here in the lower left corner next to the, uh, shutter button, you see a little kind of, you know, three little magical kind of, uh, little things that pulls up the tray of, of filters. Um, and now here you can see all the filters that are available. And now this is a live photo shot. Like this is, this is my desk right now, or my wife's desk actually where I'm filming from. Um, so if I choose this artful filter, it will apply it to the, to the, the screen there. So I can see if I take a picture right now, that's what it's going to look like. If I swipe left, I can start scrolling through the different modes of this filter. So there are eight of them. That's a very bright one. Um, there are eight of them. So I can see the different ways that it will take it. Right. Um, if you want to change it to, there's a pop art filter. There it is. Right. And you can apply kind of more kind of, you know, 1960s pop art kind of styling to it. Um, some of these are very busy. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so, um, There's but then a comic if you're book one, <laughs> yeah, oh God. um, but if you're looking for, um, less of a, um, of a dynamic one, there's the portrait filter, which is specifically around um, taking portraits of people. This doesn't really work very well because I'm taking a portrait of my dongle. Um, but you can go into your um, you can go into your photo albums and you can choose a photo. I'll choose one of my lovely son here, and so you can do the editing of a photo that's already been taken. So I can apply the portrait mode. And you can see there, I can swipe through the different modes and you can see how it's adjusting the, the color and the background and all that fun stuff there to it. Um, and you can apply these other fun little filters. This one's called Glitch, which takes in like a little sci-fi, cyberpunk kind of glitchy kind of thing to it. Um, and on a lot of these, um, some of these filters that have video elements to it, you can take a still shot of it or you can run video of it. And uh, on the video, Burke, if you zoom out, actually, um, here we are on the editing screen. On the upper right-hand corner, there's a play button, and that's where you can see the video element. And not all of them have it, but some, some of them do. And it's, it's kind of neat if you're looking for something, you know, a little more dynamic or a little more um, interesting than just the average, you know, kind of uh, Instagram filter that you might want to apply to it. Um, there's a neat one called Blue Skies that will apply – uh, clouds in the background, you know, and so that's, that's yeah. kind of neat. Um, it's pretty cool stuff and it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, you can, uh, in the edit screen, you can see in the upper right hand corner, there's like a little magic wand and little sparkles that will do kind of auto fixing to the photo, similar to, uh, Google photos when it automatically adjusts the lighting and that sort of thing. Um, and then finally in the upper right hand corner in this, the kind of, uh, the settings icon, that reveals down at the bottom of the screen all the different things you can adjust. So you can adjust shadow, highlight, clarity, uh, vibrance, exposure. So if you want to get into your your kind of post processing aspect of it, this is where you can do that. You can adjust the contrast. You can you know bump up the blacks, dye them down. You can bubble up the saturation. Um, so it gives you a lot of a lot of fun ways to work with your photos. Again, I would say that this is like. 
uh, several clicks down from professional photographer because again, you don't get a hundred percent of fine tooth, you know, kind of, um, uh, adjustments that you can make. There's actually a link on here to open up Photoshop express, which is the mobile version of Photoshop. So they're trying to connect the camera to the Photoshop series of products. But a lot of these filters are fun. There's a specific one for food. Uh, those of you who follow me on Instagram, I, I'm known to take some photos of food. And so it's nice to have a, a, a series of filters that will pump up the, the colors and bring out the vibrancy of the plate or whatnot. That's a huge kind of aspect for it. So I would say this is like a click down from professional photographers, but a click up from amateur, like somewhere in between. You're doing some cool stuff of photography. You've got this great phone. You've got a great lens. Um, you've got a great, you've got a great, you know, kind of way to take photos. What more can you do on the processing side of it? Um, and just the fact that it applies these really dynamic filters before you take the photo is fantastic because then a lot of times, you know, you take the shot and then you put these filters on and they don't quite work or you don't quite see it. It's all happening after the fact. This actually gets ahead of that and allows you to see what it is before you take the photo so um yeah so it's adobe photoshop camera uh it's free in the google play store um you do need to uh sign up for an adobe account for those of you who have um um uh if you creative already cloud. have uh, yeah creative cloud that's it you already have an adobe account so might as well just you know use it and check it out um but yeah so uh, pretty cool and i don't know you know, it's funny because the camera app is something that I used to always replace the stock camera app with, you know, I had a series of different camera apps that I would use, like that gave you more manual control and things like that. But honestly, I'm not a huge photo nut. I'm a, I'm a casual photographer. So having a camera, uh, a camera app that's a little more on the casual side that lets you do more interesting things with it, um, I find to be super interesting. I don't know. Um, what, you know, Flo, David, what do you what do you think of camera app replacements? Do you use the stock camera app, or do you have one that you replace uh, it with? I shoot photos with the stock camera app, and then I import it into another like filtering app. So I use like Kuji Cam and some other like unknown so two -step. third party. Yeah. yeah, if I want to do anything special, if I you know if I want to like make something look vintage or cool or whatever. But I you know I, I like to shoot with the standard camera app because that I feel will take advantage of the full, um, hardware capabilities of the camera on the phone. The gamut, the gamut. Yeah, exactly. Um, but this, <laughs> this Photoshop app, by the way, it just looks like it feels like all the filters that you have in Photoshop on the desktop, but kind of shrunken down and made easy. So you just press a button and whoop, it does it for you. Um, yeah, definitely. I, you know, for me, like I, the issue with shooting photos on Android is like it, as old as time eternal because we all know when you open up the viewfinder in a third party app, who knows what you're going to get <laughs> um, yep. when you press the shutter yep. button, which um, I'm guessing with I'm guessing with the this Adobe app, they're using the new camera API that leverages the full power um, of the camera in Android for phones that support it. But I don't actually know that. I've not looked into it. So yeah. I still think for Android people, the instinct is open the camera app, capture what you want, and then open another app and then turn it into what you want. And so, you know, if this app does use the proper camera APIs, that's really cool. I also think Adobe obviously is kind of like, you know, Instagram has the recognition for features, but when come when it comes to like the diversity and power of, or excuse me, of filters, um, diversity and power of filters, Adobe is like the king. You know, there, yep. There's nobody else that comes close to what they do. I so, mean, the, I, I never even yeah. used filter. I mean, like I'm, I go back in the day in the nineties with Kai's power tools, the, the plugin that Adobe eventually then bought that gave you filters and post-processing and all that fun stuff. Yeah. But um, one thing I, I forgot to mention, by the way, is that there is a whole filters store that is uh, you can download additional filters um, that you can access and they're, you know, then it looks like, and they're free. So like store is a misnomer, although I could see a world where they start charging for them. But as of right now, it looks like they're free. And um, and so there, there's uh, you can expand the different looks like you're not just limited to what is right there at launch. In fact, that that uh, kind of glitchy sci fi one that I had, uh, I added I added that by downloading from the store. Um, so, yeah. So uh, it, it looks like it's they're building a nice little platform for like to like if this can bring in the amateur 
you know, kind of casual photographer and have them step up their game a little more than going to full manual mode or something like that, then I think it's a good thing. It gets people kind of more creative with their photography, with their photography, and then they can step up to a more advanced camera and then do post-processing with another app or something like that. Um, you know, just kind of, it's anything that kind of shakes up just what the stock experience is. So, um, yeah, cool. It, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for that app spotlight. My pleasure. Adobe Photoshop camera. Go check it out. All right. So I I guess that's the end. That's it. This is the that's end. That's the end of the show. Yeah, that's here we are. the end of the show. We're still getting used to this, by uh, the way. Yeah. I'm still getting <laughs> yeah. used to, like, not having the arena and the hole. So it's going to be a little adjustment yeah. period. But thanks to everybody for tuning in and being here and supporting us and making us charts and graphs. We're... <laughs> We're incredibly lucky to have the people that tune in here every week. So thank you. No, t Tony, Tony Morrow is amazing. Like updating the wiki that, that David mentioned at the top of the show and like, and all the stats and all that stuff, that whole team, we thanked them in the last episode, Wade County in the chat room, keeping track of those stats on a weekly basis. I mean, we can't thank them all enough. So it's great, but, um, but fun show, David, thank you for joining us. It's thank always great to have me. you. It's great it's time. All, it's, yeah, it's always always a pleasure. You're always welcome here. Uh, why don't you let people know where they can find you online and find all your mm -hmm. great work? Well, you can find um, my my most dislikable takes on AndroidPolice.com <laughs> in long form. Um, you can also find them in short form on Twitter.com. I'm RDRV3 on Twitter. And yeah, those are the only places you'll want to find me. Everywhere else, I don't really do anything. All right. Um, cool. Well, yeah, Android Police is a must-go spot for me with all my for my Android news and fun stuff. So, thank you for all the great work that you do. So. Thank you. Cool. Ron, so, um, what about yes, you? What do you have me, going on? You can go see my amateur photography at Instagram.com/slash RonXO. Uh, that's where you can find me on Instagram and my uh, horrible photos. Um, not that horrible, but it is what it is. Um, and I'm also on Twitter at Ron XO. Uh, not much else to plug, uh, just plugging along and working on stuff. Uh, July is going to be very busy for me. So, uh, get ready for that. But, uh, yeah. And Flo, why don't you tell everyone how they can get in touch with you to help you help you have you help them configure their watch? <laughs> uh, before I do that, I just want to say, I've noticed a distinct lack of recycled Christmas trees on your Instagram feed, which I'm sure has everything to do with the whole shelter in place. Or maybe it's Listen. just that nobody has been able to toss out their Christmas trees because of aforementioned shelter in place. I, I will see, I will say Flo, as you mentioned, you know, those who follow me on Instagram over the years know that I do love a good, uh, discarded Christmas tree, uh, in April when you don't expect to see Christmas trees. Um, that said, uh, I've been limited to a six block radius around my apartment building and it looks like everybody was pretty good with getting rid of their Christmas trees <laughs> in a timely manner. Um, that has not stopped many of my friends from around the country of sending me their photos of discarded Christmas trees. And I will give San Francisco the award for, for giving me a discarded Christmas tree in May. Um, which was great, which is one of the things I miss about San Francisco because <laughs> the discarded Christmas tree uh, concept started when I was walking through the Lower Haight and I saw a Christmas tree in August on the side of the road. Uh, and I was just like, wow, August, that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, so anyway, but I don't even know what I posted on Instagram last. It was probably food. Um, <laughs> let's see, what was it? Uh, let's, let's, let's watch Ron as he looks at his own Instagram. Oh, it was a picture of my neighborhood. There it is. It was just a nice picture of my neighborhood and all the cop cars. So there you go. Uh, so, well, where, where can people find you? Where can people find me? You know, you can find me at FlorenceION.com. I'm all over the internet. Sometimes I write for Android Police. Sometimes I write for Life, Life Hacker. Sometimes I write for a lot of other people. I just There's a lot of places where I write. Check me out on the internet. Florence Ion. You can Google me and probably find what I last wrote. Um, that was not a brag, by the way, but it totally sounded like that. <laughs> Go I'll with it. let myself have that. Um, David, thank you again for being on the show this week. Uh, hey, if you like what you see here every Tuesday evening, 
come back next Tuesday. We'll be here on All About Android. Uh, this podcast publishes every Tuesday evening where podcasts are found. You can listen to us. You can watch us on YouTube uh, at Twit's YouTube channel. You can watch past episodes or the current episode, maybe even this episode pretty soon. Subscribe to us at twit.tv slash AAA. That's AAA. Stands for All About Android. You can leave us a voicemail at 347-SHOW. AAA. We really like those. Please don't forget, you can call us on the phone uh, or you can email us at AAA at twit.tv. We sent a call in earlier. If you'd like to let us know if you're interested uh, in using the new iOS 14, maybe you're interested in a new ROG phone, definitely send us an email. You can also follow us on all the social media channels on Twitter at uh, twit or at Android Show. We're also on Instagram at twit.tv. That's that's it for now. That's where you can find us. Uh, and I guess until next week, we will be back. Jason will be back. All of us will be here. So until next week, everyone, be safe, have fun. Um, and that's it from us here at All About Android. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Be sure to check out the other shows on the network, like my other show, Hands On Wellness. I love to share different tips and tricks that's going to help you get a better grasp on your personal wellness. Just go to twit.tv slash how and subscribe now.